Man, I love that intro music. Today is July 9th, 2018. Decky Swan Dive. How are we? We are doing great. Andy Ordinary. Phenomenal. Little Joe Walsh, ordinary average guy. If anyone didn't know that before on our intro music, that's where it comes from. Just great stuff. I love it. But you're right. Sending it this week, man. Send it into this great Monday. You know, we sent it into 4th of July last week. Now we got the this entire month of July in front of us. Three weeks. What are you going to do with it? What do you got to say for us? I'm excited for what's to come, but I love what we have right in front of us right now. The podcast, the back pocket, ordinary average guys. A boiling room. A boiling room. It's always hot in here. The weed whacker will be in and out. We're always battling something with the audio quality. One of these days, we will succeed in getting optimal audio quality. Our true listeners, the ones listening now will understand how great it is going to be when we have our own studio and mics. People are going to just be so pleased. And then when we get all those new listeners, you know what? They're going to take it for granted. And that's just the, that's just the reality at this point. You know, mm-hmm. what are you going to do? Embrace it. Um, but you know what they're always going to hear is an average quality. And we just have a great, a phenomenal, a stellar average quality this week. Andrew, what do you got for us? So we quickly realized with the 4th of July being, you know, a holiday, we have a lot of content that we could actually put out this time. It doesn't have to be a guest quote. It doesn't have to be a quote from us. Let's just make it about our day. So we posted us just sending it off of McQuaid's boat. That's where we originated the great debate, ship first boat. We don't know which one it is. but we It was know a it's, yacht. We know it's nice. Yeah, it was a massive yacht, which was probably 25 feet tall, would you say? Yeah, about and, 48 feet long. Yep, and great dimensions there. I think that's roughly what they were. Good point. And there was a, we dropped the anchor in on the St. Croix River and just sent it for America. And it was phenomenal. But, you know, we're average senders, and but we just love to do it. And what's funny is we post this on Instagram, right? Last week, you know, we don't really care about the engagement on this because, you know, it's really not regarding our podcast. But turns out when we post things on the back pocket that don't necessarily have to do with any content on our podcast, it just blows up. It's just It just performs a lot better. So we just <clears throat> we just need to realize that uh, maybe Instagram's a platform platform for promoting um, what we do on a daily basis instead of what we talk about. I don't know. I, Actions over words. Our average quality, I think, this week is understanding Instagram engagement. Simple as that. Mm-hmm. I don't know how else to say it. Our followers fluctuate left and right. I mean, we. Just, That's the funniest thing. It's ever. the robots. <laughs> we, we're just gonna put it on the robots at this point because we don't know. It's humans versus robots on Instagram. Andrew and I are uh, certified humans on Instagram, and we are just battling bots the entire time. People, anyone that comments on our Instagram is like a bot, obviously. So, or not all the time, but most of the time. Feels like it. People who not follow all the time, us. It just feels like it, right? Right. It definitely feels like it. You'll have, we'll gain, you know, 25 followers overnight and then lose 30 the next day. All bots, because we're not following bots back. We're a human podcast. So, yeah. That's an ongoing debate, an ongoing battle. It's the back pocket versus robots. Yeah, the back pocket Clone Wars. <laughs> you one could say mm-hmm. Star Wars episode two. People forget. Yeah, but the best one's always the A New Hope. Yeah, but uh, trapping the puck and transition into the theme of the week for um, David Messler. Ooh, Melser. What's his name? Melser. I will get many, his name right. How I, many times are you gonna get it right? I I have not gotten it right yet, and it's bothering me so much. I apologize, David, but. Hey, you're a fantastic interviewee, and you taught us a lot. One thing that stood out us to us the most is the humility aspect that you brought to the table. So we're going to combine what we bring to the table is the humility engine with you radicalizing, radical humility that you always bring to the table. And we have a new segment for you, humility engine. Humility engine, and I thought of this, and you thought of this uh, not too long ago. I think it was uh, one of our other high-engaging posts, but this was uh, regarding the podcast, and it was your quote about your fedora and your, it, it, how it acts as your humility engine. Find your humility engine. And I was like, you know what? Andrew and I have many things that come to mind when it makes of things that make us humble on a day-to-day basis. So that's why I wanted to turn into a segment, the humility engine segment, what keeps you humble. Andrew, you want to start? So the, I'm going to give the people what they want, and I'm going to start off with the fedora. So we got some decent engagement on that. I was pretty surprised. And, uh, it's a phenomenal picture, too. Yeah, you know, it's average. But 
why is it a humility engine for me? Uh, when I put the fedora on, um, or when I'm going through the hats to choose to put on, and I choose the fedora, I'm realizing that, you know, I'm just, I don't have really much to bring to the table. I, 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 uh, I bring a positive atmosphere and good vibes, well, I'd like to think. You're a good time guy. I, I feel like I'd like to think that, yep. And I grab the fedora to kind of like, you know, just over the top extenuate, like, yo, this guy wears fedora. He could be kind of, you know, a, sh- a schmuck, but, you know, let me see what he brings to the table. I, you, you at least got yourself in the door as far as conversations with people. So that's a start for anyone, yep. and that's good. That's how I find it. I feel like it's just a great conversation starter. It embodies me well because, you know, fedoras aren't well-liked across the board. And I would say more old ladies wear fedoras than 22-year-old men. Sure. One could argue. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, we're not going to look at the stats and say we're not wearing fedoras because of that reason. Yeah, or at least you aren't. I'm definitely not. I saw them in the store the other day, and they were on display in the clearance rack. So tells you where what society thinks about fedoras. Hey, whatever. It's your thing. It's your humility engine. What's my humility engine? Or what, what keeps me humble? Um, I have a couple. Can I say a couple? Yeah, okay. go ahead. Okay, I'll rattle my first one off is my wildly average body. So my body type is super weird, man. And I think... How would you define it in a, in a food? Food? Rattle. Like, or would you get, consider yourself like a... I'm like a crepe. A crepe? Yeah. You're like, a th- tiny, thin pancake? Well, no, because the crepes are wrapped in something, and so they're always like... They are a lot more chunky than they actually are. You're are. a filled crepe. That's, right. right. Like a strawberry stuffed crepe is kind of where I'm at. Okay. Because, you know, yeah, the crepe itself, like you just said, thin pancake. I'm by no means a thin pancake, but I definitely am a filled out pancake. So one thing uh, I, that I kind of pride myself on is that I look like I have abs and really good physique when I have my shirt on. So people are like, all right, now I want to see what's under the hood. I want to see if this guy actually has abs. And it's like, yeah, it looks like I kind of do. And then I don't at the end of the day. I kind of do, kind of don't. But, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now. That's phenomenal. I love that. Yeah, my next thing is I have a really wide stance. And so when we're in tight quarters or when I'm in tight quarters and have to sit narrowly, I just, it, I have a tough time doing it. For example, I'm sitting right here in narrow cur- quarters. If I were to spread my legs out, it would ruin the audio of the podcast. It would knock the GoPro over. You would be pissed off at me. I'd be pissed to myself. And it, it's, it's just so difficult. And it keeps me humble. Keep, keep your legs together. Didn't think that would be a problem for me, but my broad, God bless me with uh, a wide-legged stance. Yes, that's also great. Uh, back to me. Uh, two things that keep me humble. Uh, being Italian. So everyone's like, dude, you're so, like, your skin, you're dark-skinned, you're Italian, you love pasta, raviolis, yeah, all of that. Well, in reality, I'm 25% Italian, so it's like, I'm a, just as Italian as probably me, every, yeah, <laughs> you and everyone else in this house. Be, it's like, I'm not that Italian, I just kind of have, like, a little bit more vibrant Italian in me. Right, so. I think that's, like, when, we're, like, we're watching World Cup right now, and when people are, like, trying to find reasons to, like, cheer for, like, Belgium or... Greece or Germany, I don't know, whoever the teams are in, Brazil, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, I'm like 5% Brazilian, so I might as well root for them yeah. over Portugal when because I'm only 2% there, you know, it's like, okay, you know, what what gives here, man, like, you, you're you just t- taking pride on something that you're so minimally a part of, yeah. but, uh, you know, 25% is pretty strong. I'll take it. Yeah, I, I'd say it's pretty it good. It keeps me humble, though, because people are always like, oh, you're super Italian, well, in reality, Mark Amick and I are equally as, as Italian. For sure. So, another thing that keeps me humble uh, when I'm trying to articulate my thoughts, I just, uh, you know, I really feel like I got a great point to, about to be said and about to come across, and I'm going to talk to these marketing interns, they're going to get the, the best life lesson of all time and then I just stumble over my words for the next 30 seconds and I'm like I just give up with death have you got anything <laughs> yeah and then I'll take over and then probably say something either along the lines of what you're saying I'll say it way too long and I'll get distracted and talk about something that's completely unrelated and then I'll come back to it and so yeah I that would be something that I I need to or work on and something that keeps me humble is my ability to connect the dots from point A to point B. Quickest way between two points is a line. I'm more like a, a circle I, or an arc, I should say. I need to straighten that out a Intentional? Little. Intentional, yeah. Get just more direct to the point. Love it. Uh, another thing is, uh, we kind of mentioned this on the podcast a few times, but recognizing the dance floor is available, mm. I really have to humble myself before I enter. I have to, you know, sit, drink my water, because I can't drink beer anymore because I have acid reflux. So mm. I have to drink my water Good. and um, not eat my beer because I have acid reflux. I can't drink, eat a beer and drink 
You know, you get the gist. Eat a, eat a beer, <laughs> drink out. Like we said, we can't articulate our thoughts. <laughs> but going to the dance floor, I don't have great moves, but I love being out there with, with my fellow comrades. So just humble yourself and be ready to just flail your arms around and jive for that music. And just be a worm. Be a worm. Just be a worm in the dirt. I love it. That's a great great way to go about it. Just, uh, just don't care what other people think and just do you, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, one last thing would be packing my lunch at night. Uh, you know, I pride myself for this meal prep Sunday thing that I do. And really, at the end of the day, I'll meal prep like two of my meals because I don't want to spend four hours meal prepping. And then the rest of the week, it'll be like, oh, man, like I, I had to scramble. Like yesterday, you made me noodles. So thank you for making me noodles. I had noodles for lunch today. Couldn't even make that myself. Yeah. Co-host always coming through on that. Mm-hmm. Or like PB&Js. That's pretty much my life at this point. Yeah. It's very humble when you pack your lunch the night before and you literally just pack two PB&Js and an apple. And then you go to bed and you're like... I get to wake up in the morning, and I get to have this great lunch that I just packed. I'm super fired up about it. Fired up. Maybe throw a carrot or two in there because, oh. you know, you're always hungry for later, so get you need a grains. snack. Oh, it's brutal. Yeah, it is brutal. And I'm always, like, looking forward to lunch, like, oh, I'm going to have this magnificent meal. It's going to yeah. turn my day around. Not that my day was bad, but it's going to just, you know, give me that next step. And it's like, oh, I got cold chicken and noodles, or I have uh, <laughs> a frozen uh, chicken pot pie and a peanut butter and jelly. So. I, I honestly think when, so this is a perfect transition to David Meltzer. Why do you ask that? Uh, because his average quality was cooking. And I uh, the more we interview people, we're on podcast 57. Mm-hmm. The more people we interview, the more I think we should start a cooking class. Everyone's average at cooking. Everyone. And it's not like the good cooks are not wanting to be better. Yeah. And, they, and the best way to learn and become better is to teach someone. So... Bring out a decently good chef and help us learn, and then we can help other people learn. We can interview him on the podcast and see how he started his food truck company or something. So if you marketing interns know any chefs out there that want to promote how they are a sous chef and they want to become the lead chef, or they are a lead chef and they have a great restaurant that we should go and dine at and maybe um, promote them on this podcast. Yeah, maybe have a podcast over dinner at his, rest- at his restaurant. With no one there, though, so we don't get, like, the clinking of forks and knives in the background. Well, we've done one on the beach, so. Okay. We Situational it. podcasting, bringing it to your restaurant. If you want to be doing that with us, let us know. Uh, but trapping the puck and having a great transition to David Melser. But, oh, say that one more time. You didn't, I don't know. I think you hit the T. Hit the T. Melt. Meltzer. 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 I'll get it right. Yeah. Metzler. Mel- it's Meltzer, not Metzler. Put it that way. That was before the T. Yep. So. Enjoy, guys. You're going to absolutely love this. A lot of gold nuggets. Yeah, a few things I want to talk about him before. Um, This guy, he had failure in his life, and he responded like many of our guests prior. But in a way that he built himself up, his family upbringing was rather humble, and he uh, started in technology. He was a D3 athlete like us, playing football, and then he got into the technology industry, made it big, and had a collapse, whether it was investments, but it was after he, he retired, relatively young, and but he uh, had he filed bankruptcy. So he had to respond and learn from his mistakes, and he absolutely did. He went on to start uh, Sports One Marketing with Warren Moon, and then he now has a podcast called Playbook, uh, where he interviews entrepreneurs, athletes, and uh, celebrities. celebrities, and unravels their story. Anything else you want to add to that, Deck? I would say... Similar to Rick Martinez, if you haven't listened to that podcast, go back. He's the cannabis entrepreneur. He What Rick said was he learned how to scale compassion. And David Meltzer didn't necessarily say that in the interview. But at the end of the day, he really focused, it, focused on scaling compassion. He had already made it big, made millions in technology. Two best-selling books. One was Compassion Capitalism. Compassion Capitalism, exactly. And so he already made it big in technology. He burned and crashed, and then he made it. He came back and did it the right way. So he, when he was young, all he wanted to do was make money, and he did just that. But then he crashed and burned, and then he was like, all right, I still want to make money, but I want to do it for a good purpose. I want to have compassion involved. And now he's built Sports One Marketing and has written this capital Compassion Capitalism book and has been able to build his brand back. Forbes uh, keynote speaker. Yeah, top 10 Forbes keynote speaker. Like, very well-acclimated guy. And at the end of the day, like, he just wants to promote kindness. And I think that is the biggest takeaway from this, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Today's guest is David. And 
He is a CEO of Sports One Marketing, and he has a host of a podcast, The Playbook Podcast, where he has entrepreneurs, celebrities, and athletes on there to unravel their story. So first off, David, thank you so much for coming on our show. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm really excited to, to join you guys. And uh, well, before we get into our interview, we just want to ask you real quick, is your last name the most mispronounced name of all time? <laughs> No, Akbar Biajamilelo is. I can never get his name right. <laughs> exactly. I've screwed. I've I've butchered his name for a year. That's awesome. Well, we're glad to have you on. Meltzer, not to be confused with Meltzer. Thank you so much for your time. We start this uh, our interviews off with this question every single time. It's the average quality. So Andrew and I, put in perspective, are good at some things, but also just terrible at other things. We love to just document and learn from the terrible things. So, like parallel parking um, for myself, Andrew. What do you average? Up? Ironing shirts, uh, doing the artwork. The average things I just got to improve on. <laughs> so, with that, what is your average quality? My my average quality is is pretty simple. It's just cooking. So uh, you know, pretty pretty average at it, but uh, it's sustainable. <laughs> hey, we have, we've had a few guests on that are average at cooking as well. Maybe we can get them all together, start taking classes, because we got to improve that skill. That's a must. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm on the road so much, as long as I can buy dinner. And maybe, I, you know, just to be f fair and fun, I eat so well. Like people, I know you guys played football in college and so did I, but I joke around because I'll say, you know, I work out all the time and people's response to me is like, really? But I eat so well that compared to where I eat, all the time. I think my cooking's average. I think if I stayed at home with like normal chefs, maybe I'd be above average. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And would, uh, would you uh, say that you're thankful for your wife? Is she, uh, does she, she a good cook? No. <laughs> She's an average cook too, so we go out. I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to tell you how much we go out and, uh, you know, we travel so much and my kids are out. Uh, but yeah, she's, she is so, I, it's, I love and adore her, uh, but I had to teach her how to cook. And uh, when you're already average teaching someone how to cook, the best she can be is as good as her teacher. So we're, we're average at best. Uh, right on. Well, speaking of traveling, when we started getting in contact with you, we were quickly informed that you travel a ton and you were just in Nairobi. Is that correct? Yeah, I was in uh, Nairobi, went to Turkey, Nairobi, and the Bagani down in the Masamari. Uh, and so it was an 11-day trip, uh, extremely uh, fulfilling. I broke ground on a leadership and empowerment center that uh, we are donating uh, down there. It's the first community center in the Masamari. Very cool. Wow, that is awesome. And then did you also recently turn 50? Yes, I did. January 11th, I turned 50, and I have a huge 50 for 50 campaign, which is 50 birthday parties to raise money for that leadership center that we broke ground on. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna live to 111 years old. I was born on January 11th at 111, and I'm gonna die 111 years old on January 11th at 111. I don't know AM or PM yet, but I'll let my family know maybe when I get closer. Exactly, man. Well, you got. I always say you want to you want to torture someone, tell them that they have only seven years to live because seven years you can't. You know, if I tell you you have six months to live, you can go all out for six months. But when you tell someone they got seven years to live, it kind of sucks because it's like, shoot, what do I do? You know, when do I start going all out? You still got to prepare for the future. 111 so far out. All I do is prepare for the future. You know, initially it was just to overlap what I did in my normal course of business, but so many people rallied behind what we're doing and they offered to give me parties around the world. So I have Australia and Hong Kong and Mexico City and, you know, we, we had one in Turkey. I mean, it's just been crazy, uh, the support that I've gotten. So unfortunately and fortunately, the parties got out of control. 
Minnesota. We'd love to we're formally invite you to a host and a party for you. Uh, right here in our studio. All right, you, so I'm having a Minnesota party. Uh, Kevin Carter up there in Minnesota. You guys are gonna help support it and bring some people. Uh, the party's already set up, so you guys can just be co-hosts, and I'll make it easy on you. Is that fair? Uh, yeah. Perfect. I mean, another thing we can do for it, and uh, Andrew and I are gonna go ahead and say we're professional party players, but we can't throw a party at a different college. What we're gonna say is we stole, we made about 350 bucks on selling koozies. That was the very first thing we ever made money on the <laughs> podcast. The video koozie, because uh, our, obviously our back pocket has a little average beer guy with an arrow pointing up on the koozie, so I think that would fit perfectly. That is awesome, man. I really appreciate it. And just so you know, I am a above average partier. Boom. Oh, all right. Well, <laughs> and so it, let's, uh, let's get into it. Let's unpack, you know, you. I mean, you talked about, you know, your unstoppable foundation, where you're traveling, what you've kind of been doing, but it all comes back down to your mission. And we do our research, we try to research on the back pocket. What we found is your mission uh, on the internet, you know, this could have changed from time to time, but to, your mission is to make a lot of money, help a lot of people, and have a lot of fun. When and where and how did you develop this mission? Great question. Uh, when I start, when I, I ran the most notable sports agency in the world called Lee Steinberg Sports and Entertainment, most people know Lou, Lee from the movie Jerry Maguire. I met Warren Moon, the Hall of Fame quarterback, Minnesota quarterback at one time, by the way. Uh, and Warren and I started a marketing company about nine years ago called Sports One Marketing. I developed, like a normal entrepreneur, this very sophisticated mission statement that was like I leverage relationship capital in order to effectuate community service blah blah and the thing was like this long like 16 different sentences and so uh, Warren being a genius and I, I call him QB1 Kenobi he's just a wise old man right and so Warren's like what the heck does this mission statement mean so I'm reading through it and he goes so what does that mean Dave I go uh, it means I want to make money he goes Hmm, all right, make a lot of money. And he goes, what about this part? I'm like, that yeah, means I want to help people. He goes, all right, so say help people. And then that last bullshit, what does that mean? Excuse my language. I'm going to have a lot of fun. He goes, why don't we just have our, our mission be make a lot of money to help a lot of people and have a lot of fun. And I can't tell you, it's kind of like gratitude to me. I get so much credit for the simplest things and the universe loves simple. Uh, you know, when I tell people to say thank you before they go to bed and when they wake up, you think I was a genius, that I was the first person ever to invent gratitude. I think it's so funny because I probably have the most simple mission statement of any company in the world, make money, help people have fun, but everyone loves it. <laughs> That's fantastic. You know, and it's simple enough or we get it. We're small brain guys, but <laughs> hey, we love that. And uh, our, I'd like to say our position statement, mission statement is pretty simple in itself. Average hosts collaboration promote inspiration I mean we just want to hit that home so we want to open the door and you know obviously promote ourselves on uh, our own position trying to improve on that area as well nice I like that a lot um, to can you continue forth so you started the sports agency and you met Warren Moon with that um, how I want to know how you met Warren Moon and how were you able to develop a relationship with him yeah, so Warren was a client of Lee Steinberg, um, and then when he uh, graduated from the Hall of Fame in 2006, he became a partner with Lee, uh, recruiting players. Uh, Lee had the biggest and most notable sports agency. Um, I was retired, met Lee at that time, and Lee, within 48 hours of meeting me, uh, made me his chief operating officer. I took over for a guy named Jeff Morad, who ended up owning the Padres. He was the president of the Diamondbacks owned them and then bought in and sold the Padres ever since. Uh, but I became, within 48 hours of meeting Lee Steinberg, the CEO of the most notable sports agency, and within six months, the CEO. And while I was at Lee's as a partner, I became best friends and business associates with Warren Moon. Uh, Lee was an alcoholic, which is now public. So Warren and I, we spun off Sports One Marketing and uh, as Lee went through his recovery, we started our own marketing agency with that mission. Nice, that's super cool. What an awesome story. I mean, it all comes down to that for those personal connections. And it's, they say it all the time, it's not about what you know, it's about who you know, but I think what society kind of undervalues nowadays is just having genuine conversations, which is what we try to do on this podcast. Like, 
we have no idea. We didn't know who you are before this, but all we want to do is just get to know you more. And you know, if it if, if it's not meant to just make money, it's just to make a connection. So that's not an example of what we're trying to do. You know, guys, I think it's important to tell people uh, because it, it is who you know. But when it comes down to who you know, you also need to know, right? It's what you know when you're utilizing it with who you know. So I think my success has come throughout my career. I was, you know, was a millionaire nine months after law school, not because who I knew, but because what I knew. And then my continual success, the exponential uh, trajectory of my career was that I continually leveraged what I know with who I knew. Uh, but it's very important to surround yourself with the right people as well as the right ideas. Um, and I tell my teenage daughters all the time, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. So if you have the right ideas and the right people around you, you can do extraordinarily well. Okay, my dad said, said the exact same thing. Great advice. <laughs> Another thing too, uh, just kind of going off of your sports, day, being involved in sports and you know working with athletes and uh, big big businesses. Who are the people? Maybe even give a couple names if you'd like that you just enjoyed working with thoroughly. And what kind of qualities did they have that you were like, I want this in every person that I work with going forward? Yeah, absolutely. So um, athlete wise, uh, Dr. J, um, and, and that. If you had one moment, I'll tell you my favorite Dr. J story. So I was a ball boy for the San Diego Clippers. And my first game, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and the Lakers were in town for the San Diego Clippers. And he treated me like crap. In fact, I went home crying to my mom at 12 years old, 78 pounds, four foot six. That I, I, It was my dream job. I wanted to quit. Of course, my mom uh, would not let me quit. So I go back totally tentative the second game and they're playing the 76ers and there's Dr. J and I'm terrified right because I think that all the greatest players are jerks and not Dr. J man he put that big hand on my back which was I think bigger than my back and he asked me if I wanted a pair of socks and he gave me a pair of his socks and then he asked if I wanted him to sign them and he called me son and man the, the, the best part about that is I end up to be the leader of the most notable sports agency. So this question always comes forth, right? Who are the guys, who's the coolest guy you ever work with? What's the best guy? And I always use this as my example because Lee Steinberg taught me to be kind to your future self. And Dr. J has got more promotion. I never represented him. I've done business with him, I've hired him. But when people ask me who the greatest, besides Warren Moon, you know, athlete to do business with, I always say Dr. J because he's the coolest, nicest, kindest person I've ever met. And meanwhile, people always ask me the other side too, who's the biggest jerk you've ever met in sports? And I always say Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And it has nothing to do, nothing to do with me working at Lee Steinberg, right? It has to do with me when I was 12 years old, someone being kind to their future self. Um, I, I, I'm also a big fan of some big companies uh, like L'Oreal, Wheels Up, uh, the companies that I could, I wrote a book called Compassionate Capitalism about not only making a lot of money but helping people and those two companies do a great job at, at that as well. Uh, some of my other favorite people are Marcellus Wiley, Ray Lewis, phenomenal guys, uh, very inspirational guys. Uh, really, really enjoy uh, being with them as well. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. And one thing I also want to mention, so when I was listening to the Playbook podcast that you have, you mentioned how um, you would love every day if, ten, if I could help 10 people. Um, and did that kind of originate with that Dr. J moment of it just kind of impacting your life? Just as very simple as what you did in that moment, kind of carrying forth into what you're trying to do with that kind of people every day. A absolutely. And I think, you know, for me, it was a shift in a paradigm when I was a multimillionaire, retired, and I lost everything. And when I did that, uh, I realized that there's two types of people in the world, those who manipulate and, th and those who inspire. Right. And, and I wanted to be someone of service to inspire. And so I shifted the paradigm of value. And I thought about people like Dr. J as well as my mom, who was a single mom who raised six kids, 
all of us, I'm the low end of the gene pool. My siblings, the other five, went to the Ivy Leagues, full scholarship. You know, I, I don't know how I ended up, you know, playing football in, in college, but uh, th these are incredible people that put everyone else first, even though they, they had their own challenges, their own successes, et cetera. And I just think that it's so important to trust the universe, be of service. The, the universe doesn't know sizes of, of things, right? It only needs the quantity of, of deeds that you do. So I shifted my entire paradigm and what better way to start out the day than pray uh, for 10 people to put in front of you that you can help. Oh, that's just phenomenal. And you mentioned the people who manipulate you and the people that are inspiring, I think is what you said. Yeah. And what is, you know, or as young entrepreneurs and just people that are kind of going through the, the daily life of in their 20s, just grinding day day after day. How do you um, wager or understand who those people are, whether they're the ones that are going to manipulate you or the ones that you can actually trust and they're the ones that you want to be social security? How do you measure that? How do you like get a feel for that? Is there any sort of thing there that you would suggest? Yeah, so number one, you need mentorship, right? There's no uh, exchanging experience. So in order to figure out who's manipulating and in inspiring, you either can live it yourself and learn, oh, this is a guy who's, or a woman who's manipulating me, this is what it feels like, this is the situational knowledge, the dummy tax that I've just paid, or you can take on mentorship and take on at least three mentors at all time in your life, people who sit in the situation that you wanna be in, and then let them assess the situation you're in and the people that you've surrounded yourselves and heed their advice with radical humility. Uh, that's the only way, right? You can either take the experience yourself and learn from it or leverage somebody else's situational knowledge and experience. Those are the only two ways that I know to determine whether someone's a manipulator or an inspiration. And there is a subtle fine line uh, in so many of us, uh, you know, I'm 50 years old, probably more than twice your age, but uh, I still, use mentorship to assess, you know, whether somebody seems to be working or, or vibrating closest to the truth. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that as well. And then, I mean, you're going to kind of feel this theme of asking for advice because we just graduated college and we've seen what you've been able to do through the ups and downs of your career. Um, one thing that we're going through right now as co-founders of a company, um, you're deal, you deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis with Warren Moon and you been able to grow with him. Um, any advice for other co-founders and co-founders such as our, ourselves on a day-to-day -day routine? Yeah, number one, uh, stay in business. You, you know, I, I always tell people, growing a business is easy when you stay focused on making sure you're in business tomorrow. That should be the first thing you always do. So many times we get out or underneath ourselves, get in our own way, because we're so worried about things and we end up out of business because we either grew too fast, we're focusing on raising money instead of making money, we were too uh, not aligned with our partners. Uh, my father, you'll love this, gave me partnership advice because I know you two guys are partners in this business. It, my, my favorite advice that he gave me is, number one, don't ever get into a partnership. Two, if you get into a partnership, make sure your partner has more money than you. And three, if you don't listen to step one or two, go back to step number one. <laughs> so, uh, awesome. Yeah, but honestly, if uh, you're aligned on your core values, your personal values, your experiential values, your giving values and receiving values, and you both focus in on making sure you're in business tomorrow, every business evolves into success. Some it takes eight months, like Snapchat, Others, it takes 80 years like Wonder Bread, but it doesn't matter as long as you're enjoying, right? Being inspired by a consistent every day, persistent without quit pursuit of your potential, not only as individuals, but as a company, you're gonna really be successful, fulfilled, purposeful, and you'll be able to make a lot of money, help a lot of people and have a lot of fun. persistent enjoyment of the pursuit of your potential. When I heard you say those words, when you were interviewing one of your guests on your show, I was like, that's it. That, I, I just want to keep that in my mind when I wake up, when I go to bed, the consistency, the persistency, 
I mean, that just, it's, it takes a lot to remember it. And, um, but at the same time, it's just simple. It's just continue to move forward. Yeah, and it, one of the mistakes I made when I was your age, and you, you get this because you guys just graduated college, right? I thought, man, once I graduate college, I'll be happy. Once I make my first million dollars, I'll be happy. Once I do this, I'll be happy. Once I realized it was the enjoyment of that consistent, persistent pursuit of my potential, not the outcome that made me happy. In fact, that's my definition of happiness is the enjoyment of that consistent persistent pursuit of my potential and it's not just the potential as an entrepreneur it's the potential as a business partner as a life partner to my wife as a father as a community member as a a world leader a thought leader all the things i get to do an author a speaker producer of a top digital business show i reach and enjoy my potential and you know that's what is purposeful and by doing so it lessens the resistance uh in my life and the obstacles voids and shortages that most people face because i've detached myself my happiness from that outcome things come faster easier statistically more successful in my life than anyone else i know that's phenomenal i love it man I, I, we get that consistent message with all kinds of guests we have on the show and one of the uh, one of our more recent guests who said, you know, be passionate about the road to your passion. I think that just lines up entirely with what you're saying. Um, just to kind of logistically go through something here, you you were in technology and made uh, over a million dollars, and then you you know you had your fall and then you rose back up in sports. What was it about sports that just um, you loved that you could scale compassion more in sports from? What was it about it that um, enabled you to do so? It was a microcosm of life, and for me, I was blessed with a bunch of skills, knowledge, and desire uh, outside of sports. In my my family, although I grew up so poor, uh, academically, I always joke around. I go, my family is like being born into Michael Jordan's family or LeBron James, right? Like doctors, lawyers, Harvard, Penn, Columbia. You know, when I went into a test, that's the closest I probably have felt what LeBron James feels like when he steps on a basketball court. You know, it's like, all right. You know, even my bad days were, were good grades, right? And my siblings who were summa cum laude at Harvard, when they put the LeBron James type effort with the academic skills and intellect that we were gifted and born with, they really excelled, right? Where for me, sports, you know, I was the last guy picked. You know, I, I, you know, it's not even just my size and stature because I believe that there's plenty of small people that do well in sports. It was just where I came from. I had nobody to learn from, you know, unfortunately for my siblings and all of my relatives, I was the greatest athlete in my family had ever seen. And I was such an underdog. You know, I, I don't, I, I mean this seriously, I've never done anything in my life where every single step of the way, everybody was like, you can't do this. There's nothing else I've ever, I mean, even when I told people I want to be a millionaire by the time I'm 30, nobody, you know, said, oh, you can't do that. Or like, no, like even when I said I want to be a keynote, write a book, do a TV, like nobody. But like the minute I got onto a football field from the time I was seven years old, it's like, what are you doing here? In fact, when I was recruited to college, you guys will like this because you're both D3. I was recruited D1 for baseball and football. I went to San Diego State during the Holiday Bowl for my recruiting trip you know, D1 to be a punt returner. And I'm sitting on the bench and the strength coach, Coach Otten came over, I'll never forget it. And he goes, excuse me, son, can I help you? And I literally said, yeah, I'm a recruit here from Patrick Henry High School right here in San Diego. And he goes, no, no, really, can I help you? Like in his mind, <laughs> I was like, I guess I'm never gonna play here. Like that's how small I was. I weighed 147 pounds, you know, five foot seven. And, and I looked like I was 12, you know, like literally, I, I haven't still to this day, like I said, faced the challenges and rejection that sports had provided and to excel at it gave me such strength. And beyond that part, of course, the life lessons, like I said, from a microcosm and the teamwork, you guys both know this from playing college sports yourselves. You know, you live two deaths, in my opinion. If you play college or pro, the day you stop playing, you know, is, is your first death. And my second death will come when I'm 111 at 111 uh, on January 11th, of course. But, you know, you guys get it. No matter what your sport was, Division One, Two, II, or Three, 
by the time if you play that long till you're 22 years old, you live two deaths. And let alone my business partner who played football till he was 44 years old, you can imagine the death that he faced the first time. Oh, I can't imagine. I mean, I still really don't know how to feel about it yet because the football season hasn't pulled around yet. The players haven't reported to camp until like Division Three. They report until middle of August. So. I mean, once that date hits up and I don't have to go there, I mean, there'll be a little bit of a relief. Like, hey, I don't have to go just wear each dry body for three weeks before I go play a, a 15 football season. But at some point, when I go see that play, it's going to be like, wow, like, I really miss this. And I miss just being with the guys out there, experiencing the trial and error failure of um, every play and just kind of growing in that way. So, transition of that into our daily life has been one with this podcast, and two, just trying to figure out where we fit and uh, like you said it's just a it, consistency part for like you girl. Yeah, man, wait till you hear the smell of the grass. That's the one that killed me that first season. It's that weird smell of the grass in the end of the summer that just kills you. No, or eat the grass if you're less miles. One of the <laughs> um, and here's a, here's a question that, or maybe some uh, some help that we can give you for your podcast. You ask at the end of every, end of every podcast, what is your legacy? To us and what we learned in, through our football careers, legacy stands for let each generation's accomplishments continue yours. I know that's kind of a helpful, but to still put in, it really does stand for what legacy is. With that being said, Dave, what is your legacy? Or what do you want your legacy to be? Uh, for me, it's kindness. Uh, it's so simple. If, uh, if my legacy is kindness and people think about what would Dave Meltzer do in this situation? Be kind. It's such a simple way, you know, starting with the Dr. J thing that we talked about or anyone else, uh, you know, imagine if everyone on earth was kind. <laughs> what, what would this place, you know, I just got back from the Bagani in the Masamari and it was so interesting that we, we were talking about this woman who had built her own house and just overachieved and somebody asked well aren't the other people in the village jealous of you because you have this wonderful place to live and she said no we're not like that here we're all kind they come here and ask me how did I do it right where in America you know we have more than enough and everyone thinks we don't have enough and in the Bagani they don't have enough but everyone has more than enough and so if I could leave a legacy of being kind uh, this world would be happy, peaceful, joyous, and everyone would have more than enough and live in a world of more than enough. Um, and transition to straight into you your book, you were um, a compassion capitalism. How did that come about? Was that just kind of, like, again, just reiterating that whole mission of where you want your legacy to be? Well, later on in my career, I really started not only branding myself as an entrepreneur, but being seen as an icon in entrepreneurship because of, you know, rich, rags to riches, rags to riches story. And with the TV show, the podcast, you know, all the different speaking engagements that I do and uh, compassionate capitalism to me, I wanted to inspire other people that it's not just good enough to make money. You know, we got to challenge ourselves that if you're going to make a lot of money, have a purpose behind it. And what better purpose it is, is to make money for others. And that's truly from the day time I wake up, put 10 people in front of me, I can help at least till the time I go to sleep when my duty is to say thank you for all the things that I could be of service for. Super cool that you're in. I think, you know, what's one thing that we could probably talk about too is the word entrepreneur, right? I mean, that's something that has exploded with names like Gary Vee and all these other people around the world. And with the internet, you're now being able to track these people's stories. They are really being able to tap into a much larger market. There's all kinds of different things that are kind of playing into the whole entrepreneur fad or, you know, upcoming. How have you been able to leverage that? And what does, I guess, entrepreneurship mean to you? Because everyone has a different definition. I barely know how to spell it. There's all kinds of different things associated with it. Yeah, great question. Well, I think it's important to understand the difference between an innovator and an entrepreneur. So an innovator is a subset of an entrepreneur. An innovator is someone who has great ideas or innovations. 
uh, and I use McDonald's as the best example, right? The McDonald's brothers innovated the speedy service system that created a scalable system that allowed people to franchise what may be you know, one of the biggest or best franchises of all time. Ray Kroc was an entrepreneur. Why? Because he learned to monetize innovation. So an entrepreneur is someone that knows how to monetize innovation, whether it's his or, or not his. In fact, he was such a great entrepreneur that he actually bought the rights to be called the founder of McDonald's, even though he wasn't the founder and the McDonald brothers were. So it's a key distinction. An entrepreneur simply to me is somebody that monetizes innovation and that's a true entrepreneur. And for me, I'd like you to be a compassionate entrepreneur so you monetize innovation for the betterment of everyone else. And you may have already answered this question, but this is one of our favorite questions that we've just been starting to roll into every podcast. Is It's rooted in our name, the Back Pocket Podcast. This question is, what is in your back pocket? And we like to frame it in a way that when you're under stress, under anxiety, in a stressful situation, this is the type of mentality you resort to. Yeah, that's a great question. Remember, when you squeeze an orange, what comes out, right? Orange juice. When you're squeezed, when you're under pressure, what comes out is the truth about you. So in my back pocket is simply the truth. Uh, And the truth is based off of four values. Number one, under pressure, be gracious. Two, under pressure, be forgiving, have empathy. Three, under pressure, be accountable. And four, and most importantly, learn to effectively communicate under pressure. Meaning not only effectively communicate or connect to other people, but most importantly, connect to that which inspires you. Stay inspired when you're under pressure, when things get tough. Those four things, those values are in my back pocket and gratitude, empathy, accountability, and effective communication. Uh, another thing I wanted to touch on was, uh, oh God, I lost my train of thought. Um, it's a long train, man. You're fine. <laughs> you got the caboose right uh, so, next to you. Don't worry. <laughs> you told me what the question I think of it. I just told you. Okay. I would like to kind of, uh, kind of flip the interview on its head. Um, this is kind of another thing we've been doing and we really do appreciate when we ask this is just, do you have any questions for us? Um, because we're, put, we're putting our, ourselves in a situation where, again, we are seeking for advice. We're just out of college. We would love you to ask us anything and to start us to train our minds in a different way, in a different light. Yeah, I just simply would love to know if you could give any gift to humanity, what would it be? Positivity for me. Andrew, you can answer separately. Maybe. I think just being able to warrant positive energy and point people in the right direction. I think a lot of times media right now is drawing people in opposite directions, uh, whether we like it or not. But what I would just like to promote to people is just the positive energy and to make them feel comfortable about the decisions and what they think up in their own brain. And when you bring, when you do a podcast like this, you bring in all these different people from all different walks of life, but they always usually have, are all pointing in the right direction. And, and right is different for everybody but they're all pointed in a direction that they're passionate about. If I could give that to everyone to be able to just have that direction and have that positivity about that direction, I think I'd be full. My heart would be full. I think you hit it that spot on. I think one thing I would add to that is what we're trying to do um, is that gift of just having a conversation because what I've noticed going, going through college and kind of in our age frame right now is uh, you don't really get a lot of, 30 minutes of an hour conversations uninterrupted with a phone. Um, so just having a conversation, whether it's in a situation like this or just going outside, talking to other people. I mean, there, I mean, it's, it is a common movement with a lot of people right now, but continuing that movement is it's pretty cool. And I do, I've enjoyed almost every single one of them. Nice. Awesome. All right. So I remembered my question, Dave. <laughs> Stop. My brain is working again. All right. Good. So you are a Forbes top 10 keynote speaker. And I think you, that was in 2016, if I remember correctly. Um, 
We are, I mean, we weren't really good speakers before this. We started the podcast. We're still very average speakers. In, we've done the podcast for over a year. What is one thing that, or maybe a couple things that really helped you get yourself to communicate the message that, or, you know, speaking from the heart, but speaking in clearly and having that message really grasped by the audience? Yeah, you know, as you probably have noticed, uh, by topic, uh, I connect the lessons with stories. And so, you know, obviously I have a big advantage because I'm older than you, but each of the different things uh, are related to a story and they have a lesson to them. So if the lesson is, um, you know, just because somebody loves you doesn't mean they give you good advice. Right, which is a great lesson for people who just graduate college when they're asking parents and relatives and friends for advice on what you should do. Uh, you want to ask people who have situational knowledge or sit in a position that you want to be in. Well, I have a story tied to that about how I wanted to be a doctor and I visited my brother and in the hospital and I said to him, Oh, I hate hospitals. And you know, and my brother said, Oh, you know, be more interested than interesting. I'm sorry, you know. You've got to have these different stories that are related to your different lessons that you have. And I'm sorry, for, for mine, it was when I was, sorry, for that story, it's um, my mom, I asked her whether I should be a lawyer or work in the internet when I graduated law school, and my mom told me the internet was going to be a fad. So that, that's my story about great advice from people. My lo mom loves me, but she gave me horrible advice. Uh, so my biggest lesson is, don't, speaking is about being able to tell stories and, and to provide a message or a lesson. And so the more times when you're thinking about what you're presenting, think about it in terms of what, what is the point or the lesson that I'm saying and what's one of my stories that relates to it. Because then you're not memorizing you know, different things. You're just having a conversation and telling about when you were five years old or 10 years old or 30 years old, whatever it is. every single podcast. The first one is a bar story. And this is something that when you sit down on a Friday and you're grabbing a beer and there's a stranger sitting next to you and he says, hey, how you doing? And you kind of spark up a little conversation with him and you kind of want to keep his attention. So you tell him this story. What story would that be? You know, I, I usually tell them about my childhood and how I grew up with six kids and a single mom and my mom's my hero and how she would come home from school, she was a teacher, and pack up our dinners in a brown paper bag, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or a bologna sandwich, and put us in her Country Squire station wagon and go out and fill turnstiles at the 7-Eleven with greeting cards just so we would have enough money to eat. And in the car, she would tell my older siblings to help us with our homework and read to us and do all that. And I always tell them that I, out of the six kids, I wouldn't listen because all I wanted to do was be rich. And I would tell my siblings, I don't need to read because I'm going to buy my mom a house and buy my mom a car. And I was able to do that. And unfortunately, I had bigger lessons because I ended up not only losing my mom's house and car, but learning how to get it all back plus some by living life in the right way. So that my, my bar story is always about the rags to riches, rags to riches, and teaching people the lesson of, uh, you know, of being of service and uh, letting them know that it doesn't matter if you have uh, the lead as long as you have the, the heart to come from behind. And, you know, that's been my life story. That's phenomenal. How do you, you know, teach kids that? I mean, you're a father of four. How do you, I mean, and they've obviously had a, a much different life already. How do you take those values from when you were young and when you were growing up, and how do you instill that in your kids? You know, the number one thing to realize is you can't, uh, you can't put them in the same position that you're in. So, you know, uh, my biggest blessings were the hardest things that happened to me. So what you have to do is put them in the situation so that they can experience things. Uh, for example, I took my daughters to the Bugatti with me. And, you know, it was really fun for me to watch because we went from Turkey to uh, Nairobi, Nairobi to Safari. 
and it was first class, right? These are entitled little teenagers. They're more worried about the internet than anything else and bicker, you know, and I, and it was fun for me because I'd been to, to Africa before and I was just waiting for them to get down to the villages and to meet the kids and to see how much they value education and to walk into a hut with no electricity and to walk a mile down to get water and a mile back and then be told that you have to do that six times a day. My favorite thing is, is they learn empowerment through experience and when I asked them their favorite part of my trip from the first class Turkey to Nairobi where we stayed at the Hemingway, huge suites, down to the safari where it was glamping at its best and all they cared about, not the animals but the internet, uh, their favorite part, all the girls that came with us, all the teenagers, the entitled little girls, they came back empowered women because their favorite part was giving back and being of service and their perspective had changed. I can't do that, right? I, I just can as a father. So I have to figure out experiences where I can show and illustrate it through experience, not me telling them that they're spoiled or not me withholding a car because I can afford to, to do so. I do make them participate in everything. You know, If they want something, they have to do something along with me. It's not just given to them. In fact, my kids grew up, every toy that I bought them, they had to pick a toy out of the closet and give it to somebody else, they had to donate that. So there was always these types of lessons that you can do, but it has to be experience. Uh, it's impossible, you guys will find out as a dad, they can tell you be hard on your kids, but man, when, when you have the resources and the means, it's so difficult not to give your kids what you can. And learning from experience, I mean, that is the go-to, that is what people are trying to do every single day is grow and learn, and this kind of transitions right on to our Final question, what did you learn today? Well, that's a great question. Yeah. You know, what I learned is that I wish I was 22 years old and just graduated college again and knew what I knew now uh, and had my, the, the lesson is radical humility, right? You two guys are radical, radically humble for 22 year olds. You're constantly searching. I've listened to some of your stuff as well. And I love the fact that you're looking for advice. When I was your age, I knew everything. And I love your humility that you guys are open, honest, you're looking f to improve and you're looking for mentorship. That wasn't in me. And, and uh, you know, those two words sit on my nightstand and I really hope that my kids hold that same radical humility that you guys do as well. That's awesome. I appreciate that compliment. That's pretty sweet. I think that's exactly what the average quality is. It helps you um, humble yourself. It instills humility. It's a humility engine, as Andrew likes to call it. Um, and I, what I also really just appreciated too is, you know, the idea of perspective and how, how you really work to promote that and push all these different perspectives and understanding like how much value that has. So I just wanted to say thank you. And is there anything about perspective that uh, young entrepreneurs, 20, 22 year old guys that you know about perspective? You guys nailed it before. Perspective is gratitude, man. If you're grateful for everything in your past, your present and your future becomes even brighter. So live with gratitude. In other words, you said it earlier, you wanna leave your legacy of positivity. Be positive, be gracious, empathetic, accountable, and effectively communicate with others and that which inspires you. I certainly appreciate the time and having me on. I look forward to seeing you guys in Minnesota at my 50 for 50. Hey, awesome. thank you so much. We're thankful and grateful for everything you did for us. Thank you guys, take care. And that was our interview with David Meltzer. Thank you so much for coming on and taking time out of your day. I think I actually nailed his last name there. Maybe, allegedly. Hey, you, uh, you identified your weakness, your average quality, and you came back and pronounce his name right better than he ever had before so mm -hmm. phenomenal work uh, one golden nugget that I took away from David was how he's trying to impact 10 people or help 10 people every day and you know it's kind of been through his life he realized a lot of people have helped him out one was the Dr. J story that he told and how's that just snowball affected into what he wants to do on a day-to-day -day basis and I think we were part of that because you know we're just a couple of average guys reaching out to him on social media and he took 45 minutes to an hour out of his day to talk with us I bet he was, he, we were one of those 10 today. Yeah, that's really cool that we got to be a part of uh, something that he wants to experience every day. Like, he got to talk with two average guys out of the 10 that he'd like to talk to every single day. But, yeah, going back to the Dr. J story, I mean, how cool is that, you know, as a 12-year-old kid and hanging out with 
Dr. J. And it shows when you're in those, when you have those opportunities to just give and not receive anything in return, shows like that has a much bigger impact than Dr. J would ever imagine. And you know what? I bet we didn't ask him specifically, but Dave's definitely probably told that story to Dr. J. And I bet he felt like he learned a lot from that, you know? Mm-hmm. He in, totally changed Dave, Dave's life and, you know, his impact. I just think that needs to be said and needs to be documented and understand, like, re- giving out, a, a reaching out your hand when you don't need to goes a long way. Goes a long way. I mean, this was one of those interviews that we were looking forward to for a while. He was so difficult to find a time. He's the, probably the busiest man we've had to, and enc- we've encountered yet, dealing with his buddy that kind of does the scheduling. Brad. Brad. Shout out Brad. Love Brad. And uh, he was traveling, like we, like he mentioned, to Africa, to Turkey, doing the foundation work, and we, ch- we just snuck in there. And I, I thank you. Thank you. It was awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dave. And now, trapping the puck and getting after this back end. For all the marketing interns who have made it this far, Thank you for making it to the back end. Go and tell your friends about how great the back end is because it's pretty freaking awesome. What do you got to say? What's, your, what's the first thing we always do, Andrew? We always do a what did you, what did you learn in a feel-good story. Perfect. And uh, that's how we finish it up. We're so consistent. Consistent, persistent. Mm, pursuit. Consistent of your... Potential. Potential. Yeah. Consistent, persistent pursuit of your potential. Yes. That's what it was. Absolutely. Trademark David Meltzer. Love it. And what did I learn... I learned from Matt Heron, another fellow marketing intern who loves his tidbits that he just screams into my ear on a day-to-day basis. But this one was the number of heartbeats of every living creature is about the same at the end of a lifespan. So whether you're um, a smaller creature that has a lot more heartbeats per minute or you're an orca whale in the ocean who has a very minimal heartbeats but lives to their 200 at the end of the day, you probably have the same amount of heartbeats across the board with like a little bit of air, obviously, because not every creature lives as to their life expectancy, but no way. in average. So, oh, okay. So then, so everyone's heart pretty much has the same longevity as the next person, as long as it's a healthy A number heart. of beats. No Whatever beats. you want to say longevity wise. Yeah. I mean, beat wise longevity. Yeah. That's, mm-hmm. that's a really cool tidbit. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Matt Heron. Yeah. Thank you, Matt Heron. Uh, what did I learn this week? I learned how much student loan debt I will be in. Oh, what would you say? Uh, I just learned how many, how much student loans I have to pay back. Are you excited? Kind of fun. Uh, yeah, I'm excited because it's just another challenge in my way. The obstacle is the way. I'm going to conquer all 120,000 of my student loans. If anyone wants to help me out, feel free, but you don't have to. Don't feel, don't feel like you have to. Um, don't. Yeah, don't worry about it. Help but, me. Help, help you. No, yeah. I'm just kidding. Help the back pocket. Yeah. We both have student loans. Invest in the back forget. pocket. Invest, investors? Possibly, Possibly you. you. Something to think about. But yeah, I mean, it's not the greatest news, obviously, but it was inevitable. I was fated to have, you know, student loans just like everyone else. So, I mean, I got a refinance today. I found out what refinancing means, which is cool. And so I refinanced all my loans through SoFi. This is not an ad, but you definitely should go and use them because it's super easy and now I have my my tunnel vision. I'm locked in on getting this paid off. Obviously, can't pay it off all at once, but hey, whenever it gets done, it gets done. Hey, hey, it's part of life because we did it to ourselves and we enjoyed it though. I think it's well worth. It. There are people out there that are like, you know, don't go to college because you're gonna have too many student loans. The college experience is like none other. I loved it. I know many of our marketing interns loved it. If you didn't like it. Maybe share your opinion on uh, iTunes and leave us a five-star review while you're at it. Yeah. Oh, good point. Or come on the Marketing Intern Spotlight. Tell us how bad your college your college years were. I don't know. Or how you supposed to go to college. But trapping the puck. Ending on a positive note because we're positive guys. This whole theme of this entire podcast, the hour that you've just spent with us, hopefully we entertained you and provided you with a few gold nuggets to implement on your life. But to kind of sum it all up and to give you a little more perspective – Um, find your humility engine, whether it be as funny as we make it out as sitting wide legged and realizing, yo, I got to be narrow legged in this situation because I'm going to bother other people around me or I'm going to ruin the audio quality. Or if if it's like my own of just being a goofball when I wear my fedora because I just love fedoras, but I know it's kind of frowned upon to wear one, I guess. I don't know. But find your humility engine because every single person's is different. But being humble is just a way better approach to life. It affects the people around you, enhances the mood, 
And Declan, anything else you want to put to that? Yeah, I mean, one thing that I don't know if we mentioned earlier, but Dave says, you know, be radically humble. And it goes a long way. You know, it's there's no dollar amount on being humble, and there shouldn't be. But you know what? It's something that needs to be a part of your life. It needs to be, you know, incorporated day after day after day. That consistency. Consistency is important. So we ask every marketing intern out there that made it this far. You know, you got you you guys were fortunate and you guys took that time to that hour to, you know, get to this point. But go go uh pursue whatever that is that you want to pursue and be humble about it, man. Just enjoy the process. Love the process. We love you guys. Take care. Take care.